Welcome back, true sleuths and horror hounds, to the Creepypasta Iceberg series. Today, we dive right into the third level and descend deeper into these increasingly dark stories. I haven't heard of quite a few of the creepypastas from levels 1 and 2, so I'm excited to discover some possible new favorites, as I hope you are. Without any further ado, let's get into the first creepypasta listed in level 3. Chatroom 98 is a creepypasta told from the viewpoint of a 16-year-old young man named David Argento, who recounts what happened after he found an unmarked red CD-ROM case in the loft of his home. While looking for old school books he planned to burn, the disc on the inside marked Chatroom 98. Like all other creepypastas of this ilk, he puts the CD in his laptop and decides to see what's on it, only to find out that the human soul of a malicious man named Darwin Clark inhabited it and is traumatized by the interaction. The story ends with David admitting he had passed out after seeing the image of the spirit, stating he was now mentally unstable after this incident, and warning the reader not to talk to Darwin Clark. The Harbinger Experiment is another long-form creepypasta akin to the Russian sleep experiment and gateway to the mind, and was initially written by a user named Zion J. The anonymous narrator is a medical professional that recounts how they signed on with 14 other personnel to work with a ruthless man named Zimmerman, who was known for being into the occult and all things supernatural, for a top secret project called the Harbinger Experiment, in a highly contained facility located in the Alaskan wilderness. The experiment, at least on paper, was supposed to be the testing and observation of effects that extended isolation would have on the human mind, while the true motives for Zimmerman would to physically prove that supernatural phenomena were real. Zimmerman wanted to prove his obsession with the metaphysical world by allowing three entities to enter the human realm, get them to attach themselves to one of the personnel, and then trap them in one of three designated rooms. A subject was assigned to each of these rooms, all of which were on hard times and needed the money offered for their participation, and on the first day forced all personnel working the project to watch the subjects in their isolated rooms as he chanted some weird incantations. The subjects went from initially being confused to frantic, with the lights flickering and the compound shaking, then to absolute silence with no video feed, and finally to deafening screams of horror, with the workers being sent away not knowing what happened to the three subjects. The team returned to find that one of the three monitors for the subjects' rooms was back on, revealing that the subject they're in was deceased, with one of the others coming back on later to show a humanoid figure with black eyes, no hair, and inhumanly long limbs standing center stage. Security was sent to the remaining room with the still cut feed and ended up being attacked by a similar figure as another camera feed was cut off. Three of the four returning to state that their colleague and the creature were dead with one man in critical condition. The day after this, the narrator returned to the surveillance room to see the remaining subjects still in their room with the sound of someone singing Living in the Sunlight by Tiny Tim coming from the walls and the compound shaking once again. The final subject disappears from its room and the lights go out, causing total panic for all personnel as it made its way to the surveillance room to quickly murder Zimmerman while the narrator makes their escape. Though they barely escape and close the hatch behind them to seal the creature in, they are forever haunted by what took place during the experiment and their part in it. I Hate You is a Super Mario Bros. creepypasta like many others where the player experiences an extremely bloody version of the game where normal enemies seem uncannily terrified of Mario. Their gameplay ends with them facing off with Luigi as the final boss, discovering that he had betrayed Mario and Princess Peach to help Bowser. 
Mario ends up killing Luigi, and the end graphic appears on the player's screen with a now zombified Luigi. Misfortune.gb is allegedly a very obscure horror game for the Game Boy handheld system that looks like a ROM version of the Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow games. The game is comprised of a series of rooms set up like labyrinths, with a multitude of puzzles at the heart of them. The most known still from this game has a character sprite and four cabins on screen with a text box reading, Choose wrong and misfortune will befall your loved ones. Are you ready to play? If the player ever chooses incorrectly, a detailed image of some sort of demon pops up with the text, I am God here. It is said that viewing this image after losing the game caused depression, feelings of dread, or some sort of misfortune reflecting the player's experience in the game. This man is an extremely short creepypasta based upon an image that allegedly was drawn by a psychiatrist located in New York sometime in January 2006, who states that they've seen this person before in their dreams, which went forgotten until a patient recognized the man in it. Due to this weird occurrence, she sent this image to other colleagues that may recognize him, only to find that multiple people had seen him in their dreams as well. A website, thisman.org, was created and apparently over 2,000 people have recognized him, becoming so popular that the image has appeared multiple times on the X-Files TV series. God's Mouth is a story that depicts two people entering a cave of the same name, ignoring all warning signs outside of it and learning exactly why they shouldn't have. Once entering, the couple get into a fight and one of the two people decides they don't want any part of going further only to realize that they were lost in the darkness of the cave. They then start to realize that the cave is closing in around them, becoming separated to eventually be completely consumed by the cave itself. The Showers is a story told within a story for the most part where the narrator, an admitted horror junkie that loved listening to scary stories only to insert themselves in them and retell them as their own, recounts a horrifying story told to him in his school years by one of his teachers, Mr. Mays. After hearing this horrifying tale about how Mr. Mays and a group of college friends found this creepy underground passageway out in the middle of Nebraska, the narrator ends up becoming obsessed to a point where he and his own college friend go to find the same location. The two get separated after the narrator falls into the very place Mr. Mays described in the story and is met with an experience that can only be described as for a moment stepping through the gates of hell and taking a look inside. It's a long story and probably one of the most terrifying I've read by far to this point and I highly suggest you go read it yourself. How to Play Hide and Seek Alone is another ritual pasta where a person would play hide and seek with a possessed doll and goes as follows. The One Man Hide and Seek, aka One Man Tag, is a ritual for contacting the dead. The spirits, which are wandering relentlessly on Earth, are always looking for bodies to possess. In this ritual, you will summon such a spirit by offering it a doll instead of a human body. Warning, if you have psychic abilities, you may feel unwell or be prone to accidents during the ritual. Things you'll need. One stuffed doll, it must have limbs. Rice, enough to stuff the doll full. One needle and one crimson thread. One pair of nail clippers. One sharp edged tool, such as a knife, glass shard, or scissors. One cup of salt water, natural salt would be best. A bathroom with a bathtub and some form of counter. A hiding place, preferably a room purified by incense and a fuda. There must be a TV in there. Preparation. Take out whatever the doll is stuffed with. 
Once all of its stuffing is removed, restuff it with rice. Clip off a few pieces of your nails and put them inside the doll. Sew up the opening with the crimson thread. When you finish sewing, tie up the doll with the rest of the thread. Go to the bathroom and fill your bathtub with water. Return to your hiding place and put the cup of salt water on the ground. How to do it. Give a name to your doll. The name can be any but your own. When the time is 3 a.m., say your name is the first it to the doll three times. Go to the bathroom and put the doll into the water-filled bathtub. Turn off all the lights in your house, go back to the hiding place, and switch on the TV. After counting to 10, with your eyes closed, return to the bathroom with the edged tool in your hand. Go to the bathtub and say to the doll, I've found you, the doll's name. Stab the doll with the edged tool. Say, you're the next it, the doll's name, as you take the doll out of the bathtub and leave it on the counter in the bathroom. As soon as you've put the doll down, run back to the hiding place and hide. How to finish. Pour half of the cup of salt water into your mouth. Do not drink it, just keep it there. Get out of your hiding place and start looking for the doll. The doll is not necessarily in the bathroom. Whatever happens, do not spit out the salt water. When you find the doll, pour the rest of the salt water in the cup over it. Then spit out the salt water in your mouth onto it as well. Say, I win three times. This is supposed to end the ritual. After this, make sure you dry the doll, burn, and discard it later. Most important, please do not stop this ritual halfway. You must do it through to the end. This is a dangerous ritual, and I will not be responsible for what happens to you if you try. Other things to keep in mind. Do not leave your house until you have done the finishing ritual. You must turn off every single light in your house when told to do so. You must keep quiet while hiding. You do not need to put the salt water in your mouth during the beginning. You only need to do it during the the finishing ritual. Remember, if you are living with someone, you might put them in danger too. Keep the ritual under two hours, or else the spirit will be too strong to remove. For safety reasons, it might be best to keep all the doors in the house unlocked, including your front door. As well, have friends close by so that they can come help you at a moment's notice if you ever need them. Keeping a mobile close at hand would be a good idea too. The Wanderer is an urban legend based upon a picture of a figure standing in the middle of an empty road lit by an unknown source. The creepypasta describes one instance of this urban legend where a woman named Jane viewed the image somewhere online in 1996 before experiencing hallucinations of the figure in her day-to-day -day life. Jane slowly goes insane and refuses to sleep, her mother finding her curled up in her closet, clutching a note stained with blood that read, It Can't Find Me Now. The narrator states that after reaching out on a news group to see if anyone had heard of this urban legend, they received an email with the subject line, I can see you, that read, Do you see me? I can see you. The Portraits is an extremely short creepypasta written by an anonymous user about a hunter that finds an abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods he decides to stay in overnight. He goes to sleep remembering the walls having extremely detailed portraits and waits to find them non-existent. Lost Episodes is an interesting creepypasta that addresses an entire genre under the same name in an inventive way. The story is based around the narrator's friend, Sid, who went from enjoying the viewing of lost episodes and creation of fan films to isolating himself and becoming focused on making his own lost footage films. The narrator broke off the friendship with Sid over a troubling encounter that showed just how obsessed he had become over this genre of media, only to reach out again when he was in his 30s. He believed that a lot of the episodes he came across during the time since the friendship ended were created by Sid and went to his home to find it looking abandoned and vandalized. After finding a spare key outside of the house, he entered it to find the entirety of Sid's family was dead and the soul of the narrator's old friend now living within a TV as an animated character. 
Psychosis is a long, creepy pasta that was originally written by Matt Dimirsky in a diary format where the narrator slowly goes insane over each entry made as they disassociate from the outside world. It starts with an extremely odd phone call made seemingly by accident in the second entry when he called an unknown number while using speed dial to contact a friend who would supposedly call him back afterwards but mysteriously not remember where he lived. The next day, they have an extremely paranoid episode where they are so scared to open up a window they set up a webcam to look out from the safety of their computer. They don't see anything outside the window and end up having another odd conversation with a friend via webcam, receiving an email from someone they know that had no subject and read, seen with your own eyes, don't trust them, they. This causes a chain of events that makes the narrator spiral further into a deep state of mental instability, becoming so distrustful of the outside world that he destroys all of his electronics. The narrator eventually ends up in a mental health facility where the entity causing him to go insane continues to tend to him. Ronald McDonald House is a unique creepypasta that turns the concept of the charity by the same name upside down into something unbelievably terrifying. The narrator is a foster child who had a terrible reputation as a troublemaker and was eventually considered such a lost cause that the Ronald McDonald House took over his case. As soon as he was abandoned by his clearly unsettled caseworker to the mercy of staff dressed as clowns, he realized something was off. The clowns sticking a needle in him and forcing him to smile by putting their fingers in his mouth. He wakes in a padded white room covered with marks that showed others had been put through hell in there, finding themselves in nothing but a dirty and destroyed hospital gown with a photo album full of crime scene photos showing his former foster families dead. He escapes the room to find that children are hanging from the ceiling on crucifixes with intravenous tubes literally sucking the blood from them, stumbling out of the hospital to find a desolate world outside. He ends up at a McDonald's, entering to find a laptop that they then use to type the creepypasta up as they resign themselves to the insanity with the statue of Ronald McDonald by their side. Where Bad Kids Go is a short creepypasta that describes a lost children's show the narrator remembered viewing as a kid that had some creepy subliminal messaging behind it. The main thing they remembered was seeing an old, rusted door with Arabic writing on it that read, That's where bad kids go. They eventually found the studio where the show was filmed only to find the room was lined with blood fecal matter, tiny bones, and a burned microphone hanging from the ceiling. Romanian Knowledge Experiment is another, much shorter version of creepypasta like the Harbinger Experiment that takes place in Romania which attempted to test the validity of some old notes taken by a paranormal activity conspiracy theorist, Alexandru Sift. The Romanian government would send test subjects into Uia Forest to see if any would experience paranormal activity of note, which all three subjects did to different levels. The third and final subject, however, never returned with only a note found that reads as follows. If you find this, please tell my family I love them. These may be my last words. After I couldn't see the helicopter anymore, I turned on the camera to check my surroundings. I can see it 20 meters in front of me. It doesn't move as I write this. It doesn't blink. It has no eyebrows. It's higher than any human or bear I have ever encountered. It's hunched like a gorilla, supporting its weight on the extremities of its limbs. I can't even call those things hands. It has fish-like eyes, no pupils, pure engulfing darkness. Oh god, it's tearing down trees as it moves. Rap Rat is a creepypasta based upon a fictional board game made in 1992 that is allegedly possessed by a demon going by Apparat due to a curse placed upon the manufacturing company after a young Haitian girl died in a freak accident at one of their factories. 
A VHS tape accompanied each board game and apparently shows some disturbing footage of the most common fears a person could have, viewing it summoning the demon to claim the soul of the poor child playing the game. The narrator warns those reading the creepypasta of the following things. Never say apparat out loud. Saying the demon's name out loud is an invitation to them, a calling. If you've already done this, it cannot be undone. Do not try to speak to or contact Apparat. Avoid being awake between 3.30 a.m. and 4 a.m. when Rap Rat is most likely to try and scare you. Stairs is another short story that is so perfect in its simplicity. It details how a police officer responds to the home where the caretaker of an old, widowed woman who was left immobile and wheelchair-bound is found dead. The caretaker's vocal cords were slit, with the old woman stating from atop the stairs that she had been upstairs the entire time the murder occurred. The officer goes upstairs only to find there is no phone set up there, realizing that the old woman had to have been downstairs to call in the murder and coming back out to find she had disappeared. Her wheelchair still left atop the stairs. On the Bus is another unique creepypasta that takes the reader and places them in the shoes of the narrator. It describes an urban legend from Colombia about a phantom bus that picks up young women in the dead of night, their bodies being left extremely mutilated in fields the next day. You get on the bus with an oddly cheap fee and realize that you're on the ghost bus as it doesn't stop when you ring for it to. An old woman who makes you more than unsettled walking up to you. You watch as your body goes from that of a young person to a decrepit old person, completely incapable of getting out of your seat. You are sitting on your seat, facing the front of the bus. Kagekeo is the name of both a creepypasta and the name of a Japanese demon that terrorizes characters in said story. He wanders around America creating agonizingly long and painful pranks that usually result in the death of the victim. His name means shadow face in Japanese, which is also attributed to the black and white face mask that he wears and has been wearing since a young age. The Holders is a long series of creepypasta similar to the SCP Foundation that centers around an assortment of magical items with the earliest archive posts of this story being found on the random boards of 4chan on January 1st, 2007. The first story in this series is called The Holder of the End and instructs the reader on how to find the first 538 of upwards of 2,538 magical objects. This series is so extensive, there is a registered site that houses all these stories, theholders.org. If you'd like me to cover some of these items, let me know in the comment section down below. Tulpa is another experiment-based creepypasta where the narrator spent six months visualizing a copy of themselves that they would eventually interact with constantly. Just for clarity's sake, a tulpa is a sentient being created from a person's spiritual or mental powers, supposedly. Once the narrator created the tulpa and was able to manifest it regularly, they withdrew to the point that they physically attacked and worried friends at the behest of their imaginary doppelganger. Here is how I, by my own opinion, would sum up the entirety of this creepypasta. The narrator goes batshit insane and goes on a killing spree, completely disassociating with reality while doing so. Luna is the retelling of a fictional 80s text adventure game that supposedly circulated around the San Francisco Bay Area. Playing this game usually ended up making people angry because it seemed like it was a useless time waster, but someone named Michael Nevins apparently was able to get further into it until he received a set of coordinates. After going to the coordinates and digging at the site, the body of a young woman was found and the San Diego Police Department was called. The Quiet Sky is, from what I can understand of the story, an interaction with extraterrestrial beings gone wrong. 
The conversation started with an auditory response on the Allen Telescope Array to the Arecibo message sent in 1974, initially asking where the original message came from before causing a massive quake that seemed as though the dead were screaming. At the creepy threat that the extraterrestrials in question were coming, humanity is sent into a panic and the western skies started turning black with stars turning red. The narrator describes how the blackness got bigger and bigger as the foreign entity drew near, causing biblical level catastrophes to occur until one day it finally said, I am here. Happy Appy is based upon a lost Nick Jr. series about an anthropomorphic apple who heals injured children that was found by a man named Jerisim Yakovlev. The episodes get progressively darker over time where children started to be intentionally hurt and bodies of children were found in a few of them. This became so popular that three sequels were made after it, Fright House Screamers, Forensic, and Dumb Angel. This is a really long creepypasta, so I won't get into it too much, but it is one I would happily cover in a video or stream, should you'd like to hear about it. Ikbar Bigelstein is a story created by user Stephen D. Harris that describes a doll that the narrator's mother created out of scrap around the house meant to quell his fear of the dark. The doll eventually becomes sentient and would request his baby teeth during his dreams as payment for protecting him from the monsters that lurked in the shadows of his room. Once he ran out of baby teeth, he was shown a hellish landscape during his dreams that scared him into doing everything he could to get teeth to feed his protector, even if it meant praying teeth from his murdered victims. Liars is very similar to Jeff the Killer in that it details the rabid mental degeneration of a boy after he is attacked and irreversibly maimed by a group of bullies. The boy's name is Jimmy, and formic acid from a lab class was thrown in his face because of a MILF joke gone wrong, causing Jimmy to go on a rampage to get his revenge. After Jimmy was sent to the hospital for the wounds inflicted, a VHS appears at the home of the bully that led the attack showing his friends are doused in acid and the words liars appearing on the film and being whispered into the mic. Normal Porn for Normal People is a creepypasta that describes a chain letter with a random porn website being linked within. When people went to the website, normalpornfornormalpeople.com, there is a list of links on the website that depicts some extreme videos. One that is described in detail is called useless.avi and depicts a blonde woman tied up and gagged as a visibly abused chimpanzee is let into the room to maul and maim her. I'm not going to go into any further detail on the rest of the videos described, but if you'd like to investigate this further, the link for this creepypasta is listed in the video. Happy Sun Daycare is a creepypasta of a fictional daycare of the same name that allegedly got away with punishing children that went there in some extremely disturbing ways without their parents knowing or not caring if they did know. The narrator is a reporter that decided to run a story on them and set out to interview daycare employees as well as former attendees to put together their story. They are told on multiple occasions that those who misbehaved would be sent to the Grey Door Room where they would be met with and attacked by some sort of werewolf. This is confirmed when they enter this feared room and see blood-stained walls with weirdly shaped prints in the dirt floor, discovering that they weren't human or purely dog-like. The Pocket is another urban legend creepypasta written by a user named Manufacturer Inc. where the narrator goes to an abandoned silo in the middle of the woods that is rumored to be where some kids went missing. They and some friends entered the silo and descended into dark tunnels beneath it, realizing they made a grave error when they heard a high-pitched scream and get out of the tunnel to get away from whatever it is that made the noise. One of the friends was pulled into the tunnels again and murdered before the rest of the group was chased into the woods and hunted down with only the narrator and their girlfriend surviving. 
The creature, which basically looked like SCP-1741, eventually hunts them both down and subjects them to the same gruesome fate as their friends. The Diary of Mr. Well Done is a creepypasta consisting of some disturbingly written diary entries by a character named Mr. Well Done who claims to know how the reader was conceived and how they will end. Each entry tackles Mr. Well Done's beliefs and viewpoints on multiple subjects such as the dark, foolishness versus bravery, and the unknown. All entries show just how much Mr. Well Done hates humanity and wishes for it to be destroyed, the last entry depicting how overjoyed they would be watching it happen. Annie96's typing is a creepypasta consisting purely of text logs between two users who seem to be friends, Annie96 and McDavid. The logs start out pretty typical until Annie96 states a stranger was outside her home while her family was gone, eventually saying that she was seeing McDavy there and believing he was playing a prank. She goes quiet before stating that she was in her closet with a knife listening to the stranger with McDavy's face stalking her, telling her to come out. She eventually states that it all stopped in the creepiest way possible before logging off, leading us to believe that whatever it was that was in her home had gotten to her. The Pastel Man is a tall, lanky, and demonic being with light blue skin and bright pink eyes that protrude from its face. It appears when someone has a dying loved one and makes a deal to save them in return for the life of another significant person in their life, instructing them to lure that person into a secluded area and say the beast's real name to seal the deal. It will force the person the deal was made with to watch as it tortures their victim until near death, shoving a large red bug pulled from the satchel it carries down their throat, the bug disappearing once the person is completely dead. If for any reason the person who made the deal violates it in any way, they will be the monster's victim. The Rugrats Theory is an extremely popular creepypasta where the entirety of the Nickelodeon kids show is all made up within the mind of one of the main characters, Angelica. Angelica creates these fake versions of the main characters to cope with what she cannot understand, which is the following. Chucky died with his mother in 1986, Tommy was a stillborn in 1988, and the twins were created because the DeVilles had an abortion in 1990 and the gender wasn't revealed. This is just a short synopsis of the theory, but it gets so much darker, and if you want to look at the rest, the full version can be found in the links below. Who Was Phone is a short troll pasta initially posted on Reddit that has spawned many versions over the years. The version that can be easily found is that a couple is talking with a boyfriend asking how the girlfriend's dad got his phone number. The girlfriend states that her dad is dead and the boyfriend says the line, Who Was Phone? In all honesty, this is literally the dumbest thing on the list I've found so far and almost too perfect as a way to end this video. At this point, we've gotten more than halfway through the iceberg with only two levels remaining. If you like what you've heard in this video, stay tuned for the remaining two levels coming in the near future. Good night everyone and sweet nightmares. I wanted to take the time to thank my Patreons. Your support of the channel is greatly appreciated. If you like my content and like to support the channel, there is a link in the description below. All Patreons receive access to content 24 hours prior to it being posted on the channel, along with requesting a video topic and, at the highest level, being able to co-host a show with myself. If you are interested, the link is once again in the description below.